everyone's settled, I'll, I'll start. Uh, <clears throat> so before I start, I'd like to thank Kelsey for actually basically forcing me to submit this proposal, and then Michelle for uh, reviewing it before I submitted it, so she, she gave some awesome feedback. So before we start, there's not a lot of people in the room, so we can do a poll. Uh, how many of you are actually running Mesos and Marathon in production? Okay, well, everyone's here. So the, we are the Mesos and Marathon people already. Okay, great. Uh, so this talk is about moving from uh, Mesos to Kubernetes without anyone noticing. And the without anyone noticing part is an asterisk because there are some conditions applied. Uh, my name is Mishra. I used to work for a company called Hootsuite. I was, in the, uh, I was in the production operations and delivery team, which was basically responsible for building our microservices platform on Mesos and Marathon, and then we migrated it to Kubernetes. So a, a bit of a context, Hootsuite is a social media management tool that lets you manage your different social media accounts in one place. And uh, we have things like sentiment analysis, analytics, scheduling, and things like that. Uh, we have a north of 15 million customers with 800 of the 1,000 Fortune companies using us. Uh, where I work now, I'll talk about it at the end. It's not relevant right now. Um, <laughs> uh, I also work and maintain a project called Atlantis, which is basically a, a Terraform workflow tool. Uh, my contribution to the Kubernetes community has been basically being part of the community for a year, talking meetups and conferences about Kubernetes and the cloud native tools. Uh, my small code contribution is in Helm, a bunch of bug, bug fixes. Hopefully in the future, I can kind of contribute to Kubernetes upstream. So one kind of disclaimer, this talk is not a Kubernetes versus Mesos talk. Uh, both these platforms are great. We already know the platform that's better, right? I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Uh, the, 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 the agenda for this talk is basically uh, Hootsuite's journey from moving from Mesos to Kubernetes. It's very much a user story. Uh, and then we'll kind of, before we get into actually like the, the, the implementation details, we'll kind of explore the microservices pipeline. Uh, and it turns out like the abstractions that we build in the microservice pipeline actually help us move away from Mesos and Marathon very easily. And then we'll kind of talk about uh, things that we did to kind of minimize disruption. Then I'll dare to do a live demo for you guys, which is actually moving a service from Mesos to Kubernetes, uh, similar to what we did at Hootsuite. And then we'll kind of conclude with the lessons learned and conclusion. So a bit of a context, Hootsuite now is 120 plus developers with 60 plus microservices written in both Scala and Golang. We have two cluster schedulers, which includes Mesos and Kubernetes. Mesos still runs our Jenkins pipeline, uh, and Kubernetes runs our stateless workload. And we have uh, 1,500 plus servers all running on Amazon. Uh, so before we even get to schedulers, it's really important to understand like how were things before. And it'll give you a really good like kind of like where we were before and like why we moved to schedulers. So 2014, uh, you know, we were just starting to do microservices. Uh, a developer would ask for a microservice. Suddenly, an operator would appear with like five screens. I don't know why they have so many screens. And and then you had to actually explain the operators, uh, you know, why why we're going to do our SOA, uh, why we want to do a microservice, a microservice oriented architecture. Uh, and then in the end of the, like, the conversation would be like, hey, just create me a Jira ticket and you'll get your servers. So minutes later, the developer would just create the ticket and then this amazing conversation would start on Jira with like a common thread, like, hey, how many CPUs do you want? How many servers do you want? And like, how much memory do you want? And things like that. And then somehow you'd end up in Confluence, like a developer had to write an ops runbook, which is basically before they actually build a service, you had to define how the service would operate. Uh, so you basically hit every other Atlassian tool that's there in your company before hitting, like actually creating a microservice. And this is our way of kind of giving back to the enterprise. Uh, uh, so weeks later, the, the servers would be ready. And then uh, the developer at this, at this point is like super sad, like it's already taken weeks and all they wanted is a microservice in production. Uh, and then on top of that, we were doing Scala microservices back then. So they actually needed to install Java, so they needed to write some Ansible. Uh, also, like write some sensu checks to monitor the service, and then on top of that, create a Jenkins pipeline to deploy to those servers. So all that work was still to be done, and it's already been weeks. So overall, the situation isn't good, right? Like it, it's not happy days, right? The whole promise of microservices is not basically happening. Uh, so fast forward a couple of years, 2016, 2017. A developer still want microservice. I don't know why they keep on. They, they love microservices. And then uh, in this time, like five minutes later, they actually able to deploy the microservice to production without any talking to anyone. So why the five minutes part isn't interesting. The part that's interesting is actually the self-serve nature of the platform. And that was one of the keys to how we actually migrated off of the platform as well. 
Uh, so the microservices pipeline for Hootsuite looked basically made up of these big things. Uh, one was the project generator, one was the idea of pipeline as code, and then the actual platform, which was Mesos and Marathon. Uh, so the project skeleton is basically uh, the, the first thing that a developer would interact with. Uh, it was as a group at Hootsuite, we came to a consensus that we want to build microservices a certain way. So we basically uh, chose the languages, we chose the libraries, we chose the structure of microservices, and we created a Git repo and committed that to basically Git. So a developer would clone this repo and provide things like you know the the service names and the, like the, the nice names descriptions, the maintainers of the service, and choose a language. And then part of that project was also a Go binary. You just run that binary, and it would actually generate you a fully functional microservice in Golang or Scala uh, and with a with bunch of other stuff. So what was another part of this, like the, the repo, was the actual Jenkins file. So you can actually define your whole microservice pipeline in Jenkins using Jenkins files, so with stages like build, test, and deploy. Uh, and and maybe in the future, when we were actually migrating off of, of, off of Mesos to Kubernetes, this would be super useful, and you'll see how. Um, once you commit this Jenkins file to Git, it automatically, like Jenkins can scan your organization and automatically build you a fully featured microservice pipeline uh, with like build test features and things like that. We also, uh, in terms of like the, the actual microservice, we, as I said, we wrote both Scala and Golang microservices. Early on at Hootsuite, we, we made a decision that we want to kind of unify the packaging format. And we decided that, hey, like, we'll use Docker for kind of unifying that. We embraced the polyglot nature of what uh, our microservices were going to be in the future. And we decided like Docker is going to be the way we kind of want to manage those dependencies. Um, in terms of the deployment files, we also have the deployment files checked in as part of this project. So it has like things like a replica account and resources and memory and things like that, health checks, defined already as part of it. So this is all generated for you. And this is, again, important in, in, the, in the next few steps. Uh, and then we also have the make file. This is just an ease of use thing, you know, to do things like building your service, testing it, deploying it to dev staging and production. We just have simple targets that are just defined in a make file. In terms of the platform, we run both Mesos and Marathon. Some of you actually did not raise your hands. So I'll just like kind of mention what Mesos, Mesos is. Mesos is basically the resource manager that pulls all these like different nodes together and makes them feel like one machine. And then Marathon is the framework that sits on top of Mesos and lets you schedule like long living workloads and things like health checks and stuff like that. Uh, so our setup was pretty straightforward. There's nothing special here. We had like three, four masters or whatever, and they were running the Mesos master process and then Marathon alongside it. And then we had slaves that were running the Mesos slave and then do the Docker container. So the way, the way this worked is Jenkins would just say make, deploy, dev, staging, and production. This post call would come in, and this container would be scheduled somewhere in the Mesos cluster. And that's how we kind of did things. Uh, so now, you, if you're using schedulers, you probably have more than one service running in there. So, uh, so to, to route between these services, like how did the actual Mesos routing work? And this is where things get interesting, and I'll kind of spend more time in routing uh, and show you guys how the actual migration happened too in the, in the next few slides. Uh, so we kind of uh, said that, okay, we're going to do the, this like fat middleware approach, or the service proxy, or the service mesh. There's so many names for it now. But we kind of decided on, on doing that really early on. And we, use, we chose Nginx as a service proxy. And then we chose Console, which is a tool by uh, HashiCorp, to do our service discovery for us. So it kind of connected all the containers for us together. So let's say a service one would come up on some Mesoslave. We use registrator to kind of register that one Docker container in console, and that, that console is now, uh, that service is now available for console, and you can kind of interface with it using a DNS interface or an HTTP interface. And now, uh, the, the, way, the way the actual routing would work is, let's say if this service two was to talk to service one, service two would just do a simple local host call on a special port called 5040, which expands to SOA out. And then you, and it's basically a path-based call, right? Like right there, it's just a simple curl path-based call. A service is hard-coded there, the name of the service you want to talk to, and the actual endpoint you want to talk to. Then Nginx would already have this upstream defined using console, because console's kind of discovering those, those Docker containers for us. And then this Nginx router would forward call to that, the, the other Nginx router that's actually running this, this workload. And also, there's a translation here, like we convert the call from HTTP to HTTPS, and then take the request in a special port called 5041, which is SOA in. So you kind of get the idea there. And then what happens is this Nginx router just proxy forwards this call up to the, the, the actual instance that's running. So all this is great. You guys are like, OK, you actually had a great platform. You know, what did you guys do next? We spend a lot, a lot of time on actually getting this adoption go like going at Hootsuite. So we spend a lot of time writing great documentation, uh, getting te teams on board. 
And guess where, and the, so by the way, this graph is the, the service adoption curve, basically. So that's the number of services, and that is the actual, um, actual timeline. So this is where we did the zero to five minutes thing. You can see like immediately everyone wants to use microservice. They want to write it on the scheduler. So at this point, uh, sorry, that was a sneak peek. At this point, uh, we have great autonomy in the company. Uh, our service platform is doing really well. Everyone loves us, right? Like developers are loving the, the whole new platform five minutes thing because it took weeks. So there was a lot at stake when we said, like, let's move to Kubernetes. And now you guys will ask, why did you actually move to Kubernetes? We actually blogged about it. We wrote a pretty in-depth blog about why we compared all these schedulers, uh, the cluster managers and schedulers, and decided on Kubernetes. So in the end, I'll, I'll link this to the, to the slides in the end so you can kind of go through it. I'm not going to go into the exact reasons why we did, but basically it came down to Kubernetes had the right abstractions and primitives for us to build basically a microservice on, and we resonated that as, uh, as, uh, as a business. And also, uh, also in terms of like the developer tooling and the ecosystem, it's amazing that you pretty much get everything for free. So uh, it took us four months, and it was three of us. Luckily, I have both of these guys here, so Mark and Luke also here. So if you have any questions after the doc, you can ask them as well. So my whole team is here. It's awesome. Uh, it took us four months, and we got Kubernetes running in production uh, on Amazon. We told Kelsey he was super happy. He, he, I think he did that. Like In my mind, he was doing this, basically. Uh, so it was super. It was an awesome day. It was actually time to move these workloads now, right? So now we have all this stuff running in Mesos. We first need to deploy that in Kubernetes, right? Second thing, we need to figure out routing. You have to route from Mesos to Kubernetes, and also stuff that's outside of Mesos into Kubernetes as well. And then the developers that, that want to use a new Kubernetes platform have to adopt that and like kind of learn about the platform. Uh, there's great Kubernetes documentation, but you, there are some implementation details on how you would roll that out in your company. So you, know, you have to basically lay that out for them as well. So the way we kind of solve these problems is it's interesting. So like the Mesos, the Mesos Marathon platform was composed of these things, right? Project skeleton, the pipeline as code, Docker containers, and then the dynamic service discovery using console and Nginx. Pretty much everything was used to move off of Mesos as well. So each of these things were actually important to move off of it. And then uh, we also wrote some great documentation to get started on Kubernetes. And then we wrote a tool called Mesos to Kubernetes. And I'll, I'll explain what that was. So the first thing was, like, once you start looking at like, these Mesos projects, we had to actually migrate them. We started writing out these Kubernetes YAML files. And like, how do we do that? Like, we were doing that manually every time. So when we would do a pull request, like I think Luke actually just pointed us like we should just automate this. Like we're doing this every time. We know how both both schemas look like. So we wrote a simple GoLang binary that you can download and you can just run it on your project. It would read all the Meso, uh, marathon deployment files and write the Kubernetes YAML files for you because we kind of knew how the structure was. Um, in terms of the actual deployment files, we also added some new simple targets in the make file that you saw earlier. So we just added targets for deploy, K8, dev, staging. So we basically had both clusters running at the same time. So in terms of the actual pipeline, we end up deploying to both the platforms. So we duplicated the workload. We, we deployed everything in, in Kubernetes as well. So once we migrate, we deploy everything. But the, the tricky thing is like we only routed to Mesos first. So basically, everything was as it is for all the dependent services uh, and the service that was to be moved. So uh, in terms of packaging, uh, Scala and Golang microservice packaged using Docker containers. This is the benefit right here that you can actually move these Docker containers to Kubernetes. You don't have to figure out the implementation details for Scala or Golang, which is really nice. Both, both Mesos Marathon and Kubernetes understand Docker containers. So this is the benefit there. Um, in terms of routing, uh, as I said, the, the workload is duplicated in both places. You already understand how the routing works in Mesos to Mesos. So basically, we spin down the Mesos side. And the Kubernetes side is already running. And it also has that Nginx router and console. So console discovers the Kubernetes nodes and makes them available in the backends for Nginx. And Nginx basically does a routing call translation, and you'll see how. So let's see if the service, let's say that if the service two was to be calling service one again. So it would again do that local host call, which is pretty much the same for the service. Uh, but this time, you see there's no upstream backend available for service one, because it doesn't exist in, in Mesos anymore. And it would go to this special backend called the bridge. And this is, again, an implementation detail. You don't have to do this. We have a, something called the bridge, which is, again, powered by Nginx and console. And it basically lets you bridge the, literally bridge the gap between two data centers. So with console, we kind of went greenfield. We said, OK, we're going to set up a fully functional VPC and its own, network, its own networking, and then spin up Kubernetes. So we basically treated it as a different data center. 
So what would happen with the request is it would get translated to the bridge. The bridge would say, OK, I'm trying to find a microservice with this name in your data center. I couldn't find it. And then with this, this like simple dumb routing, we said everything else should just go to Kubernetes. So this was a pretty like a decision that we made because we kind of understand how our microservices work. And at this point, it ends up in the Kubernetes side. Here, the Nginx router just translates the request to, to actually say the, say the Kubernetes like conformant request. So at that point, it's just kubedns kube DNS kicking in. Uh, with, uh, with the service name default SVC dot console uh, dot local and then a port eighty eighty basically. So at that point, Kubernetes takes over. It it basically goes to the service, the Kubernetes service, and the service forwards using IP tables into the pod. So it's pretty straightforward. So on the other side, the service actually didn't. The service two did not notice that this service actually got moved because it's still doing that local host path based call. Uh, it didn't realize that this new service is now in Kubernetes. There's nothing special on the service side. And this is where the service meshes and service proxies actually shine, that the, the applications don't have to, can be super dumb, and the mesh can do the, the, the crazy routing for you. Uh, in terms of rollback, this is interesting. We, uh, we basically had it so that the routing, as I said earlier, would always prefer Mesos first. So in this case, if there was something, something went wrong, we would just spin these workloads back up in Marathon, and all the routing would just still work. So you, we would just end up hitting the Mesos side, basically. Um, so how did service calls go outside? So if you have, let's say, service one running in Kubernetes, and it was to be called some foo service, which is running in EC2 or Mesos, the way routing worked is we just basically faked a Kubernetes service. So we created a Kubernetes service with the name foo. And then we just forwarded all the traffic on a special port 5040, which would go to the local Nginx router. And then once, once that curl call was made, this request would get forward to the Nginx here. And then we had this amazing glorified regex, which Mark wrote, uh, which would just translate the call into the path-based call again. So you would end up with uh, some request looking like the path-based request again outside from the Nginx. Would go to the bridge. Bridge again knows how to route this, uh, and it would route that to, uh, to the actual food service. This is how we kind of do things. And this was kind of manual because you had to create a list of all the microservices dependencies before. OK, so in terms of the project skeleton, which is like the basically where a, a, a developer starts their microservice journey, um, what we did is we had a branch for this, like basically a Git branch that was doing the Kubernetes and Mesos, both, both the things. And when we were pretty confident, we basically deleted, deleted the Mesos side. We wanted to make sure that all the new services that were getting spun up would actually end up in Kubernetes. So we would just merge that branch. And boom, like all the new services were now getting created in Kubernetes. And we didn't really care, like, because we don't want to create technical debt and move those services again. This is, I think, the most important part, like, in the whole presentation, the documentation. Uh, whenever you bring in something new, you really need to write a documentation that's readable, that's something that people can follow. So we created a doc that would just basically give you uh, adoption to the new pl platform. So you'd say, OK, how to create a service in Kubernetes? How do you call it? How does logging work in Kubernetes? How does alerting work? And things like that. On the other side, we also created a doc to migrate. And you see that warning right there. It says, talk to us first, which is basically our team, uh, just so that we can onboard them to the new platform, try to get, kind of give them tips how to migrate the service. In terms of the actual migration implementation detail, we wrote everything down in the doc. And literally, like the, the bash commands that you have to run, uh, all the stuff that I just talked about, they can just follow through and do it if it's a simple service. All right, so now we come to the, the important part, which is the actual live demo. Let's all bow our heads to the demo god, which is Kelsey here, right? OK, let's do this. OK, so here I have, the, uh, here I have a, a three-node Mesos Marathon cluster. It's very low scale. Like This is not how we run stuff back home. Uh, and then K Kubernetes as just a one-node cluster. And then we have console, basically. Uh, so that's Marathon. Nothing's running there. That's console. There's only two services that are well, console service itself. And then the two services are the Kubernetes services that are being kind of discovered dynamically. So we can discover that Kubernetes node dynamically. Uh, OK, so in terms of the actual microservice today, we're going to migrate. It's called KubeCon 2017. It's a simple like Golang service. I'll just show you the code. There's nothing exciting here. Basically, what we're doing is we're returning back response with a random name that we are generating, and then the host name of that instance that's running it. So we can kind of know whether the app is running, so, um, so it's clear to us. OK, so let's go back here. OK, yeah, so I've already built the Docker image for this, uh, for this stuff, so we don't waste time. And we won't be using any CI, CD pipeline, so we won't be going through Jenkins and stuff, because it just takes longer. OK, so in terms of right now, we have the Mesos deployment file. So if you look at the deploy folder, it has like the Mesos, Mesos JSON file. Let me just cat that for you. Uh, yeah, so it's a simple Mesos you know, JSON file that you probably know. 
Uh, okay, and then we have the make few make targets here. So we are just deploying to production one environment, and we'll just say make deploy production. And that should go to uh, that should actually spin this up in Marathon. Yeah, so it's deploying that in thing, and we have two healthy instances of this app running. Uh, and then also consoles automatically detected this new container. Uh, uh, containers, and then they would just register as the HTTP service, the, 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 the tag HTTP service, and would run on Mesos Master 1 and 3. So that's, that's all working. This is using the registrator, basically. So, okay, that's all good. That, that all works. Let's see if the actual routing works inside of Mesos. So let's go to a Mesos Master and like, try to hit the service using that path-based thing. So if I go up here, hopefully I've hit that in my history. So here I'm doing a local host call on 5040, as you can see. Slash service is static here, and then the name of the service is KubeCon 2017. So when I do this, you can actually see this routing is actually working. It's responding with some random names and their host name. And what's special here is this header called X Skyline Router Ingress and Egress. We just inject that in Nginx. Uh, Skyline is the name of the framework that we call internally. And here, I'm, we're just always preferring the local, the local instance so since I'm on master one and this container exists. So I'm not going out of the machine. I'm just hitting the container that's inside. And you can just do that with simple uh, waiting on, 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 on Nginx backend, basically. So that, so that all works. So routing works from Mesos. So this curl call is actually acting as like the dependent service that's hitting Mesos, that, that uh, KubeCon 2017 service. So this is the dependent service which shouldn't notice anything, basically. OK, so now we've set this up. Now we'll actually start doing this migration, which is the, the interesting part. So let's go back here. Uh, OK, so the first thing we'll do is translate the file from, from uh, basically write the Kubernetes files. So we'll use uh, the, uh, the mesos.kh tool. This is not, this, I'm just faking this. This is not the actual tool. Uh, I don't work at Hootsuite anymore, as I said. So this is just a simple Golang binary, just output stuff. So this is just going to output saying, hey, like, you know, I, I just generated the Kubernetes folder for you. I'm just moving a file in the background, basically. So. I'm being super transparent with you guys, so not faking anything, by the way. So here, here we go. So here's, here's the Kubernetes JSON file, uh, YAML file. So let's uh, just get that too. Yeah, this is pretty simple here. We have a service that we're creating, and then also the deployment. And this, in, in real life, we actually use Helm charts. Uh, but for this demo purposes, I'm just generating YAML files. OK, so now next thing, we'll actually add the, uh, the make targets. So if you go to the, the, the make file here, We'll, we'll just uncomment this, which is deploy to K8s. Uh, OK. OK. So I'm just doing a kubectl apply. In real life, as I said, we use hem charts, which basically translates the uh, certain variables that you define in your service, which in YAML format, and injects that to the helm chart. Uh, and this is nothing special here. We do make, we just run this make deploy K8s. So now it's created the service in Kubernetes. We do kubectl, rusty, get pods. Here we go. Yeah, oh, actually get pods and services. Yeah. So it's created the uh, the kubecon service and also the actual pods for those services. Again, two instances were created. At this point, to the routing, if you see like nothing still like nothing's going to Kubernetes yet, right? Like we're still preferring Mesos because this app ex exists in Mesos. Okay. Now this is the the nerve wracking part. This is where we scale this thing down to zero. And wait, I want Wi-Fi, so please Wi-Fi don't, you know, don't screw up. Okay, so that's gone. And then in console, we see the service go away basically. So this console local DC says, okay, we, I don't have this service anymore. Now, if we go back to, to here routing here, you see the ingress is going to Kubernetes now. So seamlessly, this is moved. You might see some upstream errors based on. Uh, the way you shut down containers and things like that. You can do some smart retries on it, but for the demo purposes, I wasn't doing it. So if we were to see this demo, like as soon as I changed it, you'll see some upstream errors, 502s or something. Uh, but here you see that like, Ingress is actually going to Kubernetes now, and then the, the pod name, the pod name is basically the host name for the container. Okay, so let's say if something really bad happens, as soon as you see like this, the engineers see like this error rates go up and th things like that, you would just scale this back again. Right? It's like, well, just get me back to where, where I was. So you scale this back to two again. Okay. Yeah, so this healthy container is here. Let's go here. KubeCon, again, there's, there's the services available, and you see we are back on Mesos. So basically, that's like the, the, the rollback mechanism. So that is what I have for the demo. Let's go back to the presentation again. Kelsey's still chilling. Uh, okay. So in terms of the migration results, we, uh, we migrated, moved 20 services in one and a half months uh, with three people, Luke being like the technical lead, and then the two interns that basically moved most of our services, which, <laughs> which is not the best, but yeah. I wouldn't advise on that, but yeah. 
uh, in terms of the, the things going really well, like sometimes things actually don't go that well, and I'll talk about like what went wrong. Uh, things weren't as seamless as this seem. Um, we, we had like two, I guess like two outages that we kind of remember. One was what I call the bad config outage, which is when we moved these services to Kubernetes, we were using Kubernetes environment variables to kind of inject the config based on environment and things like that. And one of the variables was basically how the routing, ex the external routing works, like the, the fake service foo bar and stuff. Um, so we basically misspelled that, or something happened like that. I, I don't exactly remember. And then we couldn't route from like the service that was inside of Kubernetes outside. Like that was like as simple as that. It was just a okay, human error. Second one is like the classic security group, you know, a whitelisting error, which is happens all the time in Amazon. Uh, so let's say a service in Mesos was using an RDS database, and we have a whole like security groups whitelisting that to the white RDS database. We moved it to Kubernetes, forgot to whitelist the database. You know, the car, the call starts failing, and and we moved it back, we rolled it back. So yeah, two, two big things that caused like decent amount of impact, uh, but um, overall it was pretty like seamless. So what were the lessons that we kind of learned? And this is where like, I, I feel like the technical implementation details don't really matter so much, but like the high level stuff matters. So choose, choose, always choose the least important service first. This is pretty common, um, um, pretty simple to do. Uh, this is important because uh, you want to basically make sure that there's no business impact when you do these big translations and kind of understand, like, there's so many things that you won't realize, you can't foresee. Uh, this will kind of help you, you know, debug that. Always have a rollback plan. Um, you know, in our case, like, things went wrong a bunch of times. We had to roll back a bunch of times. Um, so, yeah, the, the, having that Mesos fallback was awesome. Uh, in terms of writing down, uh, like, the the actual deployment pipeline. So sometimes you have to actually visualize how your deployment works because there might be different flavors of uh, you know, services getting deployed. So it's nice to write it down uh, and then kind of feel, figure out where you can abstract things, where you can inject things to, to make the, the, the degradation like basically small. Uh, in terms of documentation, it should be readable for humans. Don't do like a brain dump of this is how I did it and these are the bash commands. Explain why you did it. Uh, this is really, really important, especially when we were having interns kind of go through and do that, right? Uh, in terms of being pragmatic, I think this is another important thing. Nothing is like, like you, usually you won't get services that are built the exact same way. Sometimes you actually have to go in and write some code. So it's okay to do that. There's going to be some special service. We all have them. Um, and you can just go in and do that. It's totally okay. Uh, this is, I feel, is like the most important part is like minimizing disruption. I've said this multiple times, uh, but I can't emphasize this enough. This is for both the services and actually the people. The service part is like basically making sure that like the dependencies, dependent services aren't seeing anything, any errors and things like that. But for people, you can't be asking like developers to do these migrations, ask the product manager and ask for like a bunch of story points and stuff. Like they won't, you know, they don't like that. They already have stuff to do, right? So you want to make sure that make sure that the, you know, this, the, the disruption of actually like their workflow is also like minimized. And we focused on it a lot. Right? We made it so that it's actually seamless. We wrote tools that would make the, make the translation easy. And that actually helps with the great adoption of a new platform. Uh, it's really easy to tarnish like a, an image of a new tool. Like you bring in Kubernetes and then you move a service and it causes outage. Everyone's like, oh, Kubernetes actually causes outages. And it's like as simple, it won't be Kubernetes fault. It would be something else. And you really want to, you really want to make sure that that, that image is, is maintained. And so that, that way you can drive adoption basically. So in terms of links, I have a link for that blog post of like why we moved to Kubernetes. Uh, I also have a link to, uh, um, uh, the, the abstraction that we built on top of Marathon. Uh, I think that's important because we kind of uh, kind of define everything in YAML, as you saw uh, in, the, in the slides, but in the real life, I was using JSON files. So we kind of abstracted that out in an API. And then consoles link, which basically helped us link between infrastructures uh, from both Mesos and Kubernetes side. So thank you, really appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you guys coming out. This is the last thing where I work, which I said I won't talk about. I'm joining HashiCorp as a developer advocate. Uh, I'm super excited to meet you all and talk about HashiCorp tools. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? I don't know. Yeah, here we go. Okay. We have time for questions. There you go. Uh, yeah. So could you talk us a bit about the infrastructure side of the migration? Right. How do you went from a Mesos cluster to a Kubernetes? Right. So uh, in terms of the actual Mesos side, uh, Mesos side of the infrastructure was basically built using Terraform. 
uh, and and uh, was like three nodes with some slaves uh, with some console nodes and stuff. That was like the backbone basically. And we used uh, Terraform for like writing all the uh, defined things on uh, de defined things on like all the Mesos master and stuff. And then we used Packer to kind of build these images. Uh, and we use Ansible to pretty much do all our config management at Hootsuite. Uh, so it's pretty pretty much like on, in an auto scaling group. Like the the masters weren't in an auto scaling group. The slaves were, and they were imaged. So you can actually like an, when a new node would come up, the slave could just add itself to the Mesos master and it would just work. On the Kubernetes side, we took as I said a greenfield approach. So we created all the way down from the VPC to the actual nodes. Again, we managed everything ourselves using Terraform, um, and then everything was in auto scaling group. So the API server. Uh, the the slaves, uh, the, the etcd nodes even, that was tricky. Uh, and then hopefully we eventually blog about it, but we should. Uh, and then what, what was interesting was like, um, the, we also generate like a search for every component of Kubernetes using Vault. So we generate basically dynamic search for every component. Uh, so we spend a lot, a lot of, that's why it took us so long. It took us a long time to kind of get to a production ready Kubernetes cluster managed by us. And we use an overlay to do the networking. We use Flannel to network between, between the Kubernetes nodes. Now, EKS, uh, Amazon service is out, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. I'm sure these guys will make the right decision. So it's up to them. Okay, anyone else? Everyone's happy with Mesos. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks. Really appreciate you spending some time here.